Good afternoon, and welcome to the preferred biweekly informational webinar. This week, we're discussing boiler controls. At the end of the presentation, we'll be joined by Rob Frohawk, Preferred's Engineering Manager. If you have any questions, you can put them in the chat box, or you can email them to me at deoff at preferred-mfg.com. We're going to take your questions at the end of the presentation. My email address is on every slide, so you don't even need to write it down. Boiler controls can be broken down into several major categories. Flame safeguard controls, steam pressure or hot water temperature controls, fuel air ratio controls, boiler draft controls, and feed water controls. After covering the basics of boiler controls, we'll discuss the four most common ways to blow up a boiler and how boiler controls are designed to prevent these failures. First, there's a very good textbook on boiler controls. It's called Control of Boilers by Sam Ducolo. It's an excellent resource and fairly current with modern control technology. I redrew some of the SAMA diagrams in this book uh, for this presentation. The first part of boiler control we're going to cover is flame safeguard controls. The flame safeguard system lights off, shuts down, and monitors the boiler for safe operation while it is running. It monitors boiler limits such as high steam pressure switches, low water cutouts, fuel pressure switches, and flame scanner inputs to ensure the boiler is running safe safely. Flame safeguard controls are covered by NFPA 85, and NFPA 85 provides very specific rules governing the shutdown, light off, and monitoring of boilers 12.5 million BTUs per hour and larger. Smaller boilers are covered by CSD1, Controls and Safety Devices for Automatically Fired Boilers. The two codes are very similar, but if you're going to be working on boilers in these size ranges, uh, you need to know the specifics of both codes. The NFPA boiler light off procedure uh, is like this. First, you prove that there is no flame in the boiler uh, using an input from the flame scanner. Second, you energize the combustion air blower and ensure boiler limits are made. Then the flame safeguard controller will drive the burner to purge, prove purge position with either a limit switch or feedback pots, and then purge for the selected amount of time. Uh, usually it's five air volume changes. It can be as many as eight to 10 air volume changes depending on the type of boiler. After the furnace is completely purged, the flame safeguard will drive the burner to low fire, prove low fire position, energize the pilot fuel valves and ignition transformer, and then prove that the uh, igniter flame is present before energizing the main fuel valves. Then the flame safeguard controller will de-energize the pilot valves and ignition transformer and then release to modulate. Release to modulate sort of turns the control of the fuel air ratio of the boiler over to, uh, to a different controller. And then once we're released to modulate, the flame safeguard continues to monitor the boiler limits and flame sensor. Some modern flame safeguard controls include a function called early spark termination. The controller energizes the pilot valves and the ignition transformer to light the pilot, and then after five seconds, it de-energizes the ignition transformer and uses the flame scanner to ensure the flame is still lit without the ignition transformer. Ultraviolet scanners can sometimes see the igniter spark and not the pilot flame. If this happens, the flame safeguard controller could open the main fuel valves without the pilot flame present, which could be dangerous. By terminating the spark early, the flame scanner can only be satisfied by a real pilot flame. A planned boiler shutdown can be performed if the boiler water level goes below the first low water cutout switch, or if the steam pressure goes above the first or operating steam pressure or hot water temperature switch. The planned shutdown procedure as dictated by NFP85 is, uh, the first step is optional. Uh, you drive the burner to low fire, then the flame safeguard controller will de-energize the main fuel valves and it will leave the combustion air fan running for usually 25 seconds or so for post purge. Although in some controllers, the, uh, the post purge timing is adjustable. Then it de-energizes the combustion air fan and ensures that no flame is detected in the furnace. Then uh, the flame safeguard might perform a uh, gas valve leak test. The optional drive the burner to low fire before shutting down function is called assured low fire cutoff. It reduces thermal shock on the boiler by driving the burner to low fire before shutting it off. On a boiler trip, there's a different procedure. 
a boiler trip is if uh, a more serious situation like a flame out or a gas pressure switch is tripped, then uh, the boiler trip procedure is that the flame safeguard controller will de-energize the main fuel valves and the combustion air fan and energize the alarm circuit. And this requires a, a local manual reset. An operator's got to go out to the boiler and make sure that it's safe to light off again before hitting the reset button. Otherwise, the burner just stays uh, shut down in an alarm. The boiler will trip if the flame scanner quits seeing flame or if one of the boiler limit switches opens. On a boiler trip, NFPA mandates the flame safeguard controllers shut down everything. No more fuel, no more air, and sound the alarm. For you consulting engineers in the audience today, you do not need to detail any of these flame safeguard functions in your specification. They are covered by NFP 85, but bear in mind, NFP 85 is the minimum safety requirements for a boiler. You can specify features and functions that exceed NFPA 85 to increase the safety level of the boiler. The steering committee that revises NFP 85 is supposed to be made up of one-third end users and engineers, one-third code officials, and one-third equipment suppliers. So nothing really gets into NFP 85 uh, without consensus between these three groups. And that's why uh, it's really the, the bare minimum uh, requirement in boiler safety. If you want more information on boiler flame safeguard controls, uh, the best source is really NFP 85 and you can get a copy through NFPA. Flame safeguard is digital on off. The limits are made or they're not. The boiler is running or it is not. Uh, flame scanners can be analog, digital, or both, but even the analog only flame scanners have a flame proven threshold. So the flame safeguard system either sees flame or it doesn't. The rest of the controls on a boiler are largely analog. We'll start with boiler exit control, which is sort of a non-binary way of referring to either steam pressure control for steam boilers or boiler exit water temperature control for hot water boilers. The, the control loop is virtually the same. We get our steam pressure from a pressure transmitter. That signal is the process variable for the PID controller. The set point is entered by the operator locally, or it could come from a plant master controller that dispatches all the boilers in the plant. The output of the PID loop goes to an auto manual function, and then the firing rate. Hot water boilers are the same, except the process variable input might be a temperature transmitter or thermocouple uh, measuring boiler exit water temperature. In the very smallest boilers, this system gets simplified down to two components, a Honeywell L91 direct sensing steam pressure or hot water sensor slash controller, and a mod motor that turns a jack shaft. Usually there is an auto manual switch and a potentiometer inserted into the circuit for manual control of the firing rate as well. Back in the middle bronze age, when I did a lot of boiler startups, you would see these controls on boilers as large as 500 to 600 horsepower. Nowadays, you seldom see this setup on boilers larger than 200 horsepower. Uh, don't know what a jack shaft is? It's coming up in about five slides. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on the instrumentation we're talking about, However, if you go to David Bond's LinkedIn page under Articles, you'll find a paper I did about boiler room instrumentation and how to install flow meters, drum level transmitters, pressure transmitters, and other common boiler room instruments. You can send a friend request to Mr. Bond and join him and become one of his 12,000 plus followers. Boiler exit control determines the burner heat input. Fuel air ratio control determines how much air goes with the fuel. Pictured at right is a nice looking flame from a preferred API low NOx burner. Maximum boiler efficiency is at zero excess air. However, this is not possible due to imperfect mixing of fuel and air. As excess air is decreased, rich portions of the flame will result in incomplete combustion, CO emissions, eventually unburned hydrocarbon emissions, and the potential for a boiler explosion. Excess air is the largest heat heat loss or efficiency loss for most boilers because the air we burn is about 79% inert. Maximum boiler efficiency, zero excess air is not possible due, in, due to imperfect mixing of fuel and air. This chart shows typical excess air levels and the danger zone if you burn too rich. Most burner manufacturers guarantee 15% excess air or 3% stack oxygen. Preferred burners will burn a little more efficiently down to about 10% excess air or 2% stack oxygen. But note, these excess air levels are at high fire only. 
Because of lower fuel and air velocities, fuel air mixing is even less perfect at low fire, so overall excess air must be increased to eliminate rich zones. At lower firing rate, most burners will need to be run at higher excess air levels. The diagrams here at a catalog at a Preferred's Catalog 25 are a little complicated for a PowerPoint slide, but the takeaway here is that excess air increases at lower firing rates. How much uh, really depends upon the burner. The simplest way to achieve the excess air that performs best for the burner is the mechanical way. A jack shaft system like the one pictured above uses one actuator, a jack shaft, and linkages to drive a combustion air fan and fuel flow control valves. The fuel flow control valves typically have a means of characterizing the opening of the fuel valve to match the airflow from the fan and achieve the desired excess air for all burner firing rates. Back in the day, I started up 100,000 pound per hour water tube boilers with jack shaft controls, just like those shown here. Today, only smaller fire tube boilers are equipped with jack shaft controls because fuel and electricity now are more expensive and more advanced controls are less expensive than they used to be. The problem with jack shaft controls is they can't react to changing ambient air conditions. As combustion air gets warmer in the summer or scorching hot here in Texas, the density of the air goes down and there's less air available for combustion. With a jack shaft system, the owner can retune the boiler in the spring and fall to try and follow changing ambient air conditions, but more often boilers are just tuned extra lean in the winter so that they don't run too rich in the summer, and this wastes a great deal of fuel. To compensate for different ambient air temperatures, we add some feedback to the fuel air ratio controller in the form of an oxygen analyzer. Instead of one output to a jack shaft actuator, we now have separate outputs to the fuel valve and the air damper. I think the SAMA diagram best describes this process. For each firing rate or fuel valve position, the burner startup technician inputs the desired air damper position and stack oxygen. When the burner controls are put into automatic, the oxygen trim loop compares the current stack oxygen against the set point for that firing rate and trims the air damper position to maintain the desired stack oxygen set point. Whenever I go visit a plant with preferred controls, uh, one of the first things I'll look at is the oxygen set point versus the current oxygen. They should be right on top of each other. And if they're not, uh, I look to see that the O2 trim loop is, is going in the right direction to, to correct the situation. But if your boiler is running at exactly the O2 that it's supposed to be running at at that firing rate, uh, you know that all is well with the burner. Most parallel positioning systems include an output for a force draft variable speed fan as well. So at each firing rate, the burner technician determines the best air damper position, the best VFD speed, and the best stack oxygen. When the controller is put into, mat into automatic, it biases the air damper and VFD left or right on their curves to maintain the desired stack oxygen set point for that firing rate. Not only does adding a stock oxygen analyzer allow the boiler controls to compensate for changing air temperatures and saves fuel, it also increases boiler safety by enabling a low oxygen alarm and a low oxygen shutdown of the boiler. If the stack oxygen gets too far off its curve to the point where burner operation is unsafe, the fuel air ratio controller can send a signal to the flame safeguard controller to trip the burner. Parallel positioning with oxygen trim works great for most boiler applications. However, there are a few cases where even more precise control of fuel and air is required. This control system is called fully metered combustion control. Metered because with this control methodology, airflow and fuel flow are measured with flow transmitters. At each firing rate, the technician inputs the fuel flow and airflow that results in the best combustion. If either fuel flow or airflow deviates from set point, the controller will open or close the fuel control valve or air damper to maintain set point. Fully metered combustion control reacts faster to upset conditions because the flow meters have a much faster response time than an oxygen analyzer. But oxygen trim is usually incorporated into fully metered controls anyway as a bias to the air signal and provides the safety advantage of a low oxygen trip. When are fully metered combustion controls appropriate? Um, when the fuel pressure varies as well as the air temperature, when multiple fuels are going to be burned simultaneously, if, if you want to burn natural gas and say number two oil at the same time, we will measure how much of each fuel is going into the boiler 
do some math to determine how much air is required for the burning of both of those fuels, and then that becomes the airflow set point in the fully metered combustion control. It's really the, the only way to do simultaneous fuels safely, and uh, we see it in larger boilers. When multiple burners share the same combustion air source, uh, fully metered controls are usually required. And this is the way utility boilers are run. Uh, utility boilers might have 36 burners, but just one combustion air fan. So the fuel to the burners is measured at one flow meter at the header, and the air is measured uh, at one place through the combustion air fan, and then that fuel might get split up to however many of the 36 burners are running at one time. Fully meter controls might also be appropriate on very large boilers where the ROI for the flow meters is quick. And note, very large boilers are going to be equipped with fuel flow meters regardless of the fuel air ratio strategy, so sometimes there's no extra expense in doing fully meter controls versus parallel positioning with O2 trim if you're going to have the flow meters on the boiler anyway. I showed loop controllers in the preceding diagram doing fully metered combustion control. Most of Preferred's fully metered combustion control systems are done in our loop controllers, now the PCC4. We can also program the same control strategy into a PLC. However, the least expensive way to get fully metered combustion control is with the industrial version of our Burnamate Universal. It can be set up for fully metered combustion control and it uses CAN software that is UL listed and FM approved. So final thoughts on combustion control. Use CAN software whenever possible. CAN software is thoroughly debugged and often third-party evaluated by an agency like UL or FM. Preferred's CAN software products follow UL 1998 guidelines for revisions to help ensure bugs aren't introduced during programming changes. And I think our Burnamate Universal Controller hasn't had a program change in several years. Second, don't try this at home. If you've evaluated all the CAN boiler controllers and you need a function none of them do, hire a burner company to program the controls, not a system integrator. Burner company programmers only do boiler controls. System integrators program all kinds of things, and it may have been a long time since a system integrator programmer did a boiler project. Or it could be their first boiler project. That would be fun. Finally, the burner companies have engineering staffs that can all work on each other's programs. So if you need a program change or a replacement 5, 10, or 20 years out, the burner manufacturers will be able to help you. System integrators, not so much. I can't tell you how many PLC systems I've replaced because the original programmer doesn't work there anymore, or the system integrator software company is out of business, or they just don't support that particular hardware or software anymore. The burner companies have uh, a much better continuity, and they can work on their controls you know, decades later. So our next topic is, is going to be draft controls. We've shown how adding an oxygen analyzer to the fuel air ratio control allows the control system to compensate for changing ambient temperature. On boilers with tall stacks, or boilers that share a stack with other boilers, changes in the stack draft can affect the fuel air ratio of the burner and need to be controlled. So some boilers require draft controls. Stack draft is caused by differential temperature between the stack gas and ambient air. It's more pronounced when the stack is hot versus when the boiler is warming up. It's affected by ambient air temperature. As you'll see in the next slide, the cooler the ambient temperature outside, the more stack effect you get. And also wind blowing across the stack can give you sort of a flute effect that will temporarily increase draft. And draft conditions can change faster than oxygen trim can keep up due to the slow response time of the oxygen analyzer. So the draft control loop is typically programmed to be a much uh, faster acting loop than the oxygen trim loop. The formula for draft or stack effect is found in the B&W Steambook. This is another excellent textbook for people interested in learning more about boilers. The focus of this book is more on utility boilers than industrial boilers, but it, can, it contains a lot of useful information that's applicable to both types of boilers. I have a colleague who has a 1921 edition of this book. It's really interesting. It includes diagrams of all the standard B&W boilers from their first production boiler to, I think, Rev 23 boiler that they were making in 1921. And they give a description of how the boilers changed in each of these 22 revisions. 
if you can find a really old version of this BMW Steambook, um, I think you'll find it really interesting. So two takeaways from this equation. We see that the stack effect is proportional to stack height, that's the z variable, and the difference in density between the stack gas and the ambient air. Most of the difference in density is due to the difference in temperature and be calculated using the Pervenard equation. I'm not sure why the two gravitational constants are there. Maybe this formula works on other planets too. There are also frictional losses for the gases as they travel to the stack. Frictional losses would subtract from the stack effect and are usually only significant at high fire where the gas velocities are the highest. The earliest boilers didn't have combustion air fans at all. They relied on the stack effect to induce combustion air through the boiler. The problem with the stack effect is that it can very quickly and affect the excess air of the burner and can even get so bad that the pilot flame can't, can't light off against excessive draft. The simplest type of draft control is known as floating point control. It utilizes a draft transmitter at the boiler outlet at the bottom of the stack, but above or downstream of the stack outlet damper. There is one set point for all firing rates, usually just slightly negative, and the outlet damper is positioned to maintain the draft set point. Control is proportional only, and there's a dead band too where no corrective action is taken if the draft is close to set point and this reduces boiler outlet damper hunting. Essentially, with floating point draft control, close is good enough. Floating point draft control works in most boiler applications. In fact, our New York City technicians use floating point draft control for most boilers in high-rise buildings. But there are situations where more advanced control is required. Preferred calls this PID draft control. With PID draft control, the burner technician can input a desired stack outlet position for each burner firing rate. They can also change the draft set point as a function of firing rate. When the burner is changing firing rates rapidly, instead of depending on the PID loop, the controller knows where to position the stack damper from the position input by the technician. The draft control PID loop takes over when the firing rate stabilizes and quits changing so quickly. PID draft control is most often used on boilers that cycle from high fire to low fire and back very quickly and very often. So when does a boiler need draft controls? Typically if the stack is over 50 feet tall, or if two or more boilers share a common stack. Uh, ultimately, if you're not sure, or your application is, is maybe borderline, uh, consult your burner manufacturer. They'll let you know if your stack conditions require draft control for their burner. Also, uh, if a boiler is experiencing flame failures, or flame failures at light off, uh, called either PTFI or MTFI, the draft situation in the boiler should be investigated. Most boilers that don't have draft controls don't even have draft gauges anymore. So if the boiler has a draft problem, there may not be any instrumentation to indicate that fluctuating draft is the issue. Several years ago, Preferred replaced boiler controls at a facility where the controls were still under warranty, but all three boilers kept having nuisance flame failure trips. A preferred technician noticed the tall brick stack common to all three boilers, measured the draft with a manometer, and found it fluctuated wildly as the boilers ramped up and down. We end up replacing the boiler controls with preferred controls that included draft control, and once the draft control was introduced and the new boiler, new boiler controls retuned, the boilers quit flaming out. So draft was the, or poor draft control was the underlying cause of all their flame outs, but because they didn't have any draft instrumentation, um, nobody even thought to, uh, to consider uh, draft fluctuations. With preferred equipment, you have a lot of choices for draft controllers. We make the JC-22 standalone draft controller. It is usually supplied with the JC-22 uh, draft transmitter. We also make the preferred CDR, that's a direct sensing draft control that includes a linear actuator to drive a stack damper. Then finally, draft control is included in all of Preferred's latest uh, integrated boiler controllers, including the BurnerMate Universal and the FlexFit boiler controllers. Our next topic is boiler feed water control. As steam leaves the boiler, it needs to be replaced with water. Water level control is critical to boiler operation. If the water level gets too low, it exposes boiler tubes and they can overheat and rupture. If the water level gets too high, 
Water can get carried into the steam distribution piping, causing it to swing around and make scary noises as slugs of water work their way through the steam piping. If the steam is feeding a turbine, you really don't want to hit the turbine blades with slugs of water. So there's four basic types of feed water control. You have on-off feed water pump control, single element feed water control where we're looking at only uh, the boiler drum level, and then there's two element feed water control where we look at water level and steam flow, and then finally there's three element water level control where we look at drum level, steam flow, and water flow inputs. Single element, two element, and three element drum level control use a feed water pump that is constantly running and modulate a feed water flow control valve on the side of the boiler. Fire tube boilers less than 200 horsepower will often be supplied with on-off feed water pump control. Larger fire tube boilers will typically have single element feed water control and water tube boilers that are naturally more sensitive to water level disturbances um, are more likely to have two element or three element control uh, to maintain set point. On off feed water control uses a contact in the low water cutout device to energize or de-energize a feed water pump motor starter. I think the most common device used for this is a McDonnell Miller 157S. It will typically have a switch to shut off the boiler on low water and a switch set at a little higher level to toggle the feed water pump on and off. Schematically, single element drum level control is shown like this. The drum level signal, usually a 4 to 20 milliamp analog signal, comes from a differential pressure transmitter mounted on the boiler. <laughs> the controller will either be a true PID controller, or on smaller boilers it will often be a proportional only controller that sends a 4 to 20 milliamp output to a feed water control valve. Preferred likes to use B-balls or characterized seat ball valves that have a little more linear characteristic to them. Not only does this system offer more precise drum level control than on-off control, but the controllers usually incorporate an auto manual capability that's nice and the ability to change water level set points if you need to. There's a fundamental problem with feed water control called shrink and swell. As the steam flow out of the boiler increases, the pressure in the boiler decreases, causing the formation of more steam bubbles and the effective water level in the boiler rises. We call this swell. Also, the firing rate controller will increase boiler heat input when it senses the steam pressure decreasing and this causes more steam formation and adds to the effect of the water level increasing. A single element feed water control that only sees water level will respond to the high water swell by decreasing feed water flow into the boiler. The problem is feed water flow is decreasing while steam output is increasing and when the swell effect ebbs the water level can be well above can be well below set point. The opposite effect shrink happens on decreasing steam flow. This effect can be managed in fire tube boilers with proper PID loop tuning, but water tube boilers have much more shrink and swell and will often need a more sophisticated control system. When we go to two element feed water control, we add steam flow as a feed forward. Instead of relying on just drum level control, which gets faked out by shrink and swell, now the controller can see the steam flow output out of the boiler in addition to the drum level. There's a math block on the output of the drum level PID block that allows the technician to tune the output of the controller to both steam flow and drum level. In the long run, the water flow entering the boiler has to match the steam flow leaving the boiler. So in many ways, steam flow is more useful for feed water control than drum level. The downside is the steam flow meter is an expense to the system, but many customers want a steam flow meter on their boiler for other purposes anyway. Two element feed water control is a big improvement over single element feed water control but it isn't perfect because we can't see how much water we're putting into the boiler. We can only see the feed water flow control valve position and no feed water valve has a perfectly linear flow versus valve position curve. By adding an input for feed water flow, we can precisely match the amount of water entering the boiler to the amount of steam leaving the boiler and finally conquer the effects of shrink and swell. Note, I sometimes see three element drum level control done wrong. I'll sometimes see specifications where the third element is not feed water flow, but feed water pressure. There is no reason to correct for feed water pressure because most steam plants use fixed speed feed water pumps, so the pressure is constant. Preferred does a lot of systems with variable speed drives on the feed water pumps by customer request. 
However, we only recommend VSDs on feed water pumps if the plant wants to run different steam header pressures. Some plants will run at higher pressures when they are running a steam turbine. In that case, you have to increase your feed water pressure to overcome the new higher boiler steam pressure. Our final topic is going to be preventing boiler explosions. Boiler explosions used to be a very big deal. They were very common. And in fact, uh, the American Society of Mechanical Engineers was originally founded in 1880 to determine codes and practices to prevent boiler explosions. Their first meeting had 30 people in it. The primary function of boiler controls is to operate boiler controls safely. And now that you know some of the basics of boiler controls, I'm going to illustrate specifically how boiler controls are designed to prevent the most common causes of boiler explosions. And note, all U.S. boiler and burner manufacturers strictly follow NFPA and the other relevant codes. Nobody in the U.S. makes an unsafe boiler or burner. Boiler explosions usually fall into one of these categories. A steam side explosion, dry boiler firing, a fuel side hard light off, or fuel side rich combustion. And we're going to dive deep into each of these causes. A steam side explosion is caused when the boiler steam pressure exceeds the design pressure of the boiler plus whatever safety factor is in the design. When the boiler pressure vessel ruptures, the steam escapes, plus the water in the boiler flashes to steam and you get the 1000 to 1 volume change from water to steam. This type of explosion is very rare. There are at least five devices on the boiler designed to prevent a steam side explosion. First. The firing rate control should sense the high steam pressure and drive the burner to low fire if the steam pressure exceeds set point. Second, if the steam pressure continues to rise, the operating steam pressure switch should open and shut down the boiler. This would be a planned boiler shutdown like we discussed earlier. If the steam pressure continues to rise, the high steam pressure switch or the excess high steam pressure switch should trip the boiler and energize the alarm. If none of these safeties work, uh, the boilers are required to be provided with safety valves or pressure relief valves. Each of the two safety relief valves are sized to discharge more steam than the boiler is rated to produce. One valve is typically set about 5 psi higher than the other. These valves are very loud when they're discharging. They will get everyone's attention in the plant. I've been in the boiler industry since 1990 and I've never heard of a steam side explosion occurring. The second type of boiler explosion is, a, uh, is caused by dry firing the boiler. When you run a boiler completely out of water, the steam pressure goes down. So the firing rate goes to high fire. The metal in the boiler is not protected by water anymore, so it gets hotter and hotter. And eventually the overheated metal creeps and the boiler sags on its mounts and it's a total loss. Worse, an operator might notice there's no water in the boiler gauge glass and restores water to the water flow to the boiler. Maybe the feed water pump was tripped off and he resets the feed water pump. When the water hits the hot steel, it flashes the steam and ruptures the boiler pressure vessel. I've seen a boiler dry fired. I've never personally seen a boiler explode after running out of water, but it is one of the most common causes of boiler explosions. Most boilers have four safeties to prevent dry firing. First is the feed water control system. When running properly, it keeps the boiler at the normal operating water level. Second is a low water alarm switch that notifies the boiler operators the water level is below set point. Third is a low water cutout switch that when opened shuts off the burner. Fourth is a second low water cutout, usually called the auxiliary low water cutout switch, that trips the boiler and energizes the common alarm. Often the low water cutout and the auxiliary low water cutout switches are different types of devices. One will often be a float switch, while the other is a capacitive probe and relay. And then finally, preferred controllers include an input for a stack temperature thermocouple. If the stack temperature goes over set point because there's no water in the boiler, the preferred controller trips the boiler. This is a difficult device to disable because the input is a thermocouple, not a switch that can be jumpered. And it's also a safety device that doesn't cause a lot of nuisance trips. If your normal stack temperature is 400 degrees, you can set uh, this safety at 600 degrees and you'll never hit it when there's water in the boiler. But as soon as the boiler runs dry, your stack temperature will go to 600 degrees and beyond very quickly.
The next type of boiler explosion we're going to discuss is, is called a hard light off. Hard light offs can be very hard and damage the boiler or stack. The entire boiler light off procedure detailed in NFP85 is designed to prevent a hard light off. When a boiler shuts down, uh, there will always be some combustible gases in the furnace. The post purge function is supposed to blow these combustibles out of the boiler before it's lit off again. You can also accumulate combustibles in the furnace if the fuel valves are leaking through into the boiler. This condition is minimized by using a double block and vent assembly in the gas train. For fuel to leak through, both valves have to be leaking by. Fuel safety shutoff valves are required to have proof of closure switches and they're required to be approved as safety shutoff valves. The boiler controls check to make sure the proof of closure switches are made before it tries to start the burner light off sequence. Next, the combustion air fan is energized and the burner driven to high fire. Position switches or feedback pots prove the dampers are in purge position and then the purge time runs to make sure at least four, at least five air volume changes are blown through the furnace. This is done in case the fuel valves are somehow leaking and have filled the furnace with combustibles. Next, the burner is driven to low fire, the igniter is energized, the flame, the igniter flame is proven by the flame scanner before the main fuel valves are energized. Early spark termination is optional and can be used to make sure the flame scanner isn't fooled by the igniter spark. And again, I see these light off and shutdown functions specified all the time in great detail. It's, it's not really required. They're all detailed in NFPA 85 and the burner and control manufacturers have to, uh, have to abide by NFP 85 or on smaller boilers, uh, CSD1. So the final cause of boiler explosions we're going to take a look at is a, is a fuel side rich combustion explosion. Proper burner design is especially important with jack shaft control systems. The jack shaft, drive rods, and linkages need to be sturdy. The drive levers need to have holes in them, not slots. The drive rods also need to be pinned to the jack shafts. I mentioned before that I've started up 100,000 pound per hour boilers with jack shaft controls. The jack shaft systems followed all these rules to ensure that slippage or hysteresis didn't cause a fuel rich uh, combustion condition. I worked at Cohen Company in the 1990s. They were the number one supplier of burners for water tube boilers, and most of their burners had jack shaft controls, but done in a way that, were, that was safe even on very large burners. If you look at uh, some very small burners designed for fire tube boilers, you'll see that uh, often these rules that Cohen Company and others had for large water tube boilers are often violated. And in this picture, I don't know whose burner this is. It, it might even be Chinese. You can see that uh, some of the drive levers have holes the way they're supposed to, but the drive lever on the left-hand side that goes to the combustion air damper is slotted. And that slot uh, could allow the drive lever to slip if things aren't tightened down well enough. And remember, in a jack shaft system, there's no feedback. We don't know what the stack oxygen is. So if you get into an unsafe condition, there is no instrumentation uh, that's gonna let you know. However, most boilers, uh, they'll huff and puff and they'll vibrate and they'll smell really bad when they're running fuel rich. But not many small boilers uh, are required to have operators present. So there may be no one around to hear the boiler running rough. That's why we included an oxygen analyzer as a safety device. Parallel positioning systems don't have jack shaft or linkage assemblies but they do have servo couplings that can slip. If something changes and the stack oxygen goes too low, a boiler controller with oxygen trim will shut down the burner and sound the alarm. Finally, an opacity monitor will tell you if a boiler is smoking. Oil-fired boilers will smoke if they are run even a little bit rich. Gas burners aren't as likely to smoke, but they will smoke if the stack oxygen gets close to zero. But in either case, an opacity monitor like the preferred JC30 will detect a boiler smoking and sound an alarm or trip the burner. Thankfully, boiler explosions are rare. Most are caused by operator error. So preventing even operator error is an important part of boiler control system design now. There's sort of an unfortunate dynamic going on in the boiler industry. As equipment becomes more automated, the training level of the operators is going down. 
We spend quite a bit of time training plant people to understand and not just rely on the automation we're providing. Well, that's it. Thank you for sticking around to the end. We packed a lot of information into one webinar. If you want to learn more about any of the topics covered today, I recommend you pick up one of the books I mentioned earlier. And if you have a project that might involve preferred burners or controls, please reach out to me or one of the sales engineers at Preferred. We're going to take your questions now, and we're going to be joined by Rob Frohawk, who's the engineering manager at Preferred and virtually unstumpable on uh, boiler controls questions. You can submit your questions via my email address in the chat box or in the chat box on your screen. And we'll do a little bit of post-production on this webinar to include the, the Q&A portion. And then in a day or two, it'll go on Preferred Utilities YouTube channel where we archive these webinars forever. So now we're going to go to uh, questions and answers. Hey everyone, welcome uh, to the question and answer portion of our webinar. Gilsai, are you um, are you on the uh, the feed? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Great okay. to have you. Gilsai, can you just give a little background on yourself before we get into these questions? Sure. Um, again, I'm um, I've been in this industry for the last 40 years, um, seeing it on from early on from single point positioning system as Dave has described. So I've been with the industry for 40 years um, and uh, seeing different types of control systems and the advent of uh, new changes in the controls. Uh, so basically the important thing here is I've seen it uh, back in the late 70s all the way up to today at 2020 and Preferred has done a lot of different combinations to pretty much uh, besides the basic systems to uh, satisfy the requirements of your boiler plant. So um, anyways, uh, go ahead with the questions. Great. Uh, once again, thanks for being here. So let's just start at the top. It says uh, someone's asking, when would I need to install an opacity sensor or monitor? Um, opacity sensors are there for a several reasons. Uh, if you are firing oil, uh, there are certain times that uh, your state, your city will require opacity meters uh, and uh, opacity meters are there for both, uh, definitely for oil. Uh, it, it prevents you from second guessing what they call a Ringelman number. And uh, I would highly recommend opacity meters for all fired facilities. Uh, as Dave has described it earlier, uh, opacity meters do help on the extreme end from a gas fired system if you do have a scenario where you do have uh, uh, high fuel ratio over air. Uh, again, that's an unusual circumstance, but uh, I would recommend that at least for oil. Excellent. And it's and it's a, it's a safety thing, really, um, correct, for oil? Yes, it, it is a safety thing, and especially on installations where you actually have stacks, uh, and that is outside the building, what, what I could call out of view, and uh, opacity meters are there with alarm settings that you could change, and if it's not, the stacks are not visible, uh, you want to be notified uh, that you are having a bad opacity. Uh, it's also in many ways a fuel saver. So, um, you know, you know, there's something wrong with your, your burner system, perhaps uh, maintenance uh, must be performed. Uh, and it's an early warning. So certainly it's a safety system for that perspective. Great. Next question is, what's a typical range of stack oxygen set point? Again, it depends on the burner capability. Um, if we were to say if your burner is capable of um, running at low oxygen, meaning that you're running at about one and a half, one percent O2, if your burner technology allows you to run that low, then your set point would be um, on the high, anywhere from 70% to 100%. And on some burners, you could run from 50% to 100% at a set point of 1.5%. And wow. one of the O2, uh, O2 sensors, uh, part, of the, part of the offering that Preferred has is there's a low O2 alarm that you could also adjust and set. So if your particular burner has a, 
uh, performance capability of running at 3% being your optimum performance, um, you could set it for 3%. And again, those set points are performed during uh, a qualified startup engineer starting or commissioning your unit knows the limit of that particular burner. So having an O2 analyzer on hand with an O2 trim is beneficial, uh, even if even if the burner cannot perform below 3% O2 or the best condition is 3.5% O2, at least is able to maintain the best efficiency with the best set point they're set for. So when a fuel air ratio curve is established, the O2 set point is uh, based on that curve. So uh, typical startup commissioning will have a CO analyzer besides an O2 sensor, and you could determine what is your best efficiency for that particular burn. Great. Uh, next question. In a, high, in a high turndown application, do you recommend a globe type control valve with a 4 to 20 electro pneumatic uh, positioner to control the entrance of the natural gas to a burner instead of a 420 servo motor coupled with a butterfly valve? Do, I need, do you want me to read that again? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so in, in a high turndown application, do you recommend a globe type control valve with a 4 to 20 milliamp electro pneumatic positioner to the control uh, to control the entrance of natural gas to the burner uh, or a 4 to 20 servo motor coupled to a butterfly valve okay this is that's a good question it, it actually will have a long answer if we were to get into details with that <laughs> so so it, it, it if you understand the design of a globe valve and a butterfly valve it all comes down to perhaps what what the burner design is. So in other words, if you have a, um, if you design a, a control valve to be operating on the butterfly, meaning that if you could utilize that butterfly valve so that at 100% firing rate, you are say at 70% um, at open, uh, then you are fully utilizing a a butterfly valve does not provide you a, what I call a linear characteristic, but with a control system, you could slowly open that control valve. So you could try to linearize that perhaps versus a globe valve, you could do the same thing. I think the, the separation between a butterfly valve and a globe valve is this, is that sometimes the burner requirements are at the burner is lower pressure and you have a low supply pressure. So a butterfly valve provides you a higher valve coefficient, or we call a CV factor, where in a globe valve takes a higher pressure drop. So the question, the answer to that question is really depends on what your system design is and what's your available pressure um, to to take into that point. If you have a specific application, uh, if whoever asked this question, we'd be happy to pursue that differently. Uh, because we need to get into the whole system uh, design perspective. So it all depends on what your supply pressure and how much you need at the, at the burner. Um, so uh, so it, again, it depends. Uh, but if you have something specific application, please send us an email and we will address that specific application. Excellent. Uh, next question is, um, how much improvement in a on average firing efficiency is achieved with fully metered control? That's a good question. Yes, uh, a fully metered system, as Dave has explained it, um, there's uh, it. If you look at the overall system from improving efficiency, the end of the the end of the day, what what you need to do is, if, if you consider efficiency in the combustion side, it's always been the O2, the final O2, and the the final device must be selected so that your actuators are repeatable. So they must be repeatable, and that it should be designed properly so that um, you could attain your highest efficiency setting in your burner. So um, on a fully metered system, it is critical that you have 
size the flow meters correctly for the operating range that you need it to be. So it has to be one repeatable so that the sizing is critical. The flow element selection must be critical so that you have the accuracy from uh, as close as you can through the range. So that's the critical side of side about meter system. The other side of the metered system is that you need to select your airflow uh, method of measuring airflow correctly. There are several other methods in measuring airflow depending on the type of control system you have and the type of burner that you have. So um, airflow is the most critical side. It has to be correctly uh, size because most of the time airflow is a low differential pressure so that's the critical side so i would say uh, your best efficiency on a full meter system is to properly select the flow metering devices and um, for your specific application uh, design it for higher turn down and usually airflow meters have a very low differential so that uh, again the airflow element must be must be sized correctly for your application. Terrific. Uh, yeah, there there are several there are several types of flow elements, and they're the ones that must be selected properly. Um, once again, it just seems uh, seems like you can go on forever about these topics, Gil, which is awesome. Uh, but we got to keep moving, going down the line. Um, so another one is, and we're gonna go till three o'clock. So if if anyone didn't get their questions answered, they can email um, David Oaf, which was in the webinar, um, or myself, and I will get the question over to um, whoever needs to answer, or whoever be the best person to answer it. Um, just a few more here. How much improvement in the average fire efficiency is achievable? Okay, sorry, we just did that one. Um, each steam boiler fire tube, I'm sorry. Is um, each steam boiler fire tube and Scotch uh, Mariner has a pressure loss from the burner inlet to the boiler outlet. Let's say for a specific 10, uh, a specific boiler, it's 10 inches of water. What would the typical system for the burner fan static pressure setting? So that seems like a very specific question. Okay, so, so the way the system works, first, your fan must be sized. Uh, typically, the rule of thumb that we use at Preferred is this, if we were to provide a burner system, a combustion system. So if you have a furnace pressure of 10 inches of water column, and you, the, the, the fan must be sized so that it would take into account the loss across the burner plus the pressure drop across the boiler. So let's just assume that the burner pressure drop is 7 inches of water column and your furnace back pressure is 10 inches of water column. So it would be the, the pressure drop of the burner plus the, the back pressure on the furnace. So that would be 17 inches of water column. Plus you have to add other losses as an example. If you are using a parallel positioning system, then you would have a loss on your damper. So let's just say at fully open, your damper loss is say half an inch of water column. So you're now at 17.5 inches of water column. And then if you have a silencer coming into the fan, let's just say you do, then you take another say half an inch on top of that. So you're now looking at 18 inches of water column. That's fairly high pressure. And then typically what we do is we, um, increase, we designed the fan so we have 10% overage from a flow and another 21% overage on the static pressure. So um, I'm not sure if I answered that question, Michael, but uh, we're talking about fan design and sizing, right? The selection. Yeah, I think you got most of it. And okay. if, if you, if there is, if you, if you listen to um, Gil and you have something else to ask, Feel free to go ahead. I'm sure he'll he'd love to uh, to talk more, or we'll get someone to you that will help you out. Um, so let's talk about. Uh, we have two other questions. Let's go with this one. At at what point sizing is fully metered control implementation available? So how big do you want to put fully metered size or control on your boiler? 
Um, fully metered system uh, on the larger boilers, I would say uh, 100,000 pounds per hour, 90,000 pounds per hour higher, you would want to probably consider a metered system. But really the key decision, if you want to go metered or power positioning system, is the selection of hardware. Uh, in other words, if you have to have, uh, that rule of thumb has slightly shifting lately because there are more available larger torque actuators. And um, it's just that from a, from a uh, larger boiler, you have a lot more things, a lot more um, dynamic going on in a large boiler. But uh, it, actuators are now available uh, in, in systems that are uh, all the way up to uh, 1,000 foot-pounds, 1,200 foot-pounds that are electrically actuated. Um, you have pneumatic systems that certainly give you the same amount of torque. Um, on, a, on a metered system, um, I would say consider 90,000 pounds per hour and higher. But again, as explained before, what is critical is the selection of the final devices, the, the flow measuring devices, and the final drive devices. So um, um, I would try to go above that because a, a larger equipment would have a lot more dynamic going on with it. Um, um, so uh, especially especially on multi-burner systems, no question about it, you got to go full meter system. And if you have right. a specific application, again, don't forget to write uh, to Michael or Dave and they could uh, uh, up, so hopefully answer that particular application. There's just so many different approaches there. So circumstances that needs to be considered. Okay, so we just got uh, one more that we can take and just uh, just very quickly, if you would, Gil, comment on this. It says, for boiler feed water control, can you comment on drum level input plus feed water flow input, so I guess two inputs, uh, plus VFD feed water pump with bypass? Sure. For sure. about so, 250 horsepower boilers, so it seems pretty sure. specific. Sure, I'll comment on that one. First of all, uh, on something that size, I, the only time I would consider uh, – using a two element using feed water uh, as, a, as a second element the decision point there would be do you have a supply pressure problem on your feed water uh, that, that would be one reason what I would use a, uh, a uh, uh, measuring feed water flow the other reason is if you have two boilers, say two boilers, and not just a single boiler, but if you have two boilers and that your pump sizing, feed water pump sizing is such that when you have two boilers, uh, your pressure set points would be different. In other words, if you got one boiler running, you may have a feed water supply of say 200 pounds and you're operating at 150 pounds. But if you have two boilers running at full capacity, you're going to find out that your feed water pressure on your pump is now dropped from 200 pounds to 165 pounds, which means that your valve needs to be more open. Uh, feed water valve needs to be more open to get make sure you have enough water to generate that steam. Then I would uh, resolve that problem by using a second element. But the solution may have been using a variable speed drive on a pump on a pump that could actually, um, that the pump could actually have the capacity uh, using a feed water pressure as a feedback to increase your pump speed to maintain 200 pounds on two boilers. So I would say if you have a single burner approach, um, my first choice was to make sure that uh, your feed water valve is, is sized correctly. Two is that your feed water pump is sized correctly. If you have a problem with the pump capacity, um, having a second element may not solve that problem, but perhaps providing a, a, a feed water pump with a variable speed drive would give you the pressure that you need. But I would look into sizing my control valve correctly and having an understanding of what the feed water pressure ha is at higher firing rates. So there's a, I would say, an inherent problem between the two. 
typically in a 250 horsepower. I would, if you have a wide load swing, I would go with steam flow rather than a feed water flow. If you have a feed water pump issue, then I would look into perhaps uh, solving that problem first by making sure that you have the right size control valve for your feed water. If that's that valve is so undersized that you need higher pressure on your feed water pump, then you may want to look at the feed water valve sizing. And then lastly, the feed water pump itself. Again, this is a interesting solution. Uh, if you do have that problem and you're at that point, uh, we would like to talk to you to help you uh, give you a direction, understand the problem a little bit more, uh, to be able to help you in this particular application. Absolutely. And uh, I know there are some questions we weren't able to answer um, in our time today, but um, feel free, everyone that, if you still have a question, feel free to email myself or David O. And also the questions we didn't get to, I'll try to forward you over to the person that could answer those questions and maybe even help you more in depth, because we did get some that were pretty in depth and we'll try to um, try to definitely get back to you on those. So once again, thanks everyone for coming. I really appreciate it. And thank you, Gil, for uh, filling in for uh, the, uh, the question answer, and I really appreciate it. Um, once again, we will be posting this webinar on YouTube and on our website, and you can you can go to Preferred Utilities uh, or preferred-mfg.com and click on webinars. This webinar will be there with the entirety of the question and answers uh, section, and also it will be on YouTube. If you just search for Preferred Utilities, it will be there. Um, Gil, do you want to say anything before we sign off? Well, thank you for uh, their time, and, um, and Michael, uh, thanks for the invitation. I hope hopefully we will answer their questions. Absolutely. All right, everyone, thank you for coming, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.